UI and has been a coach in Kaiser and in um, various collaboratives for many organizations uh, for many, many years, and with Diana Cava, who's led QI efforts at her residency program at San Francisco General Hospital. So they'll be here to give their perspectives on how to make um, culture change and how, to, and how to help it sustain over time. So the agenda for today, we're going to do just a little bit of housekeeping and talk about accreditation. The uh, main piece of our agenda is, is how to guide change in your organization, specifically how do you manage resistance. There's always a group of us, um, none of us really like change, change is hard, so how do you work through that in a positive way? Um, how do you optimize your communication strategies? How do you engage leaders? And then at the end, we're going to go through our calendar just so we're all on the same page about what happens next. Um, here is our faculty. I think you've already heard from all three of us. And again, we've got um, myself, Diana Coffin, and Christine Cristobal, who will be with you today. So I just thought I would start just for a couple of minutes with the WIFM question, uh, what's in it for me? Because to be honest, <clears throat> I started my career as a QI atheist. I was um, really bored with QI. I think I saw it as something you do for auditors. It's a binder you put on your shelf, the people who cared about it were these checklist people running around with measurements that I was in, in this business to take care of people, to get things done, and I didn't have a lot of patience for it. And then after the experience of being a medical director several years at a very complicated clinic, I learned the hard way that <clears throat> um, unless you pay attention to improvement principles and process and how to get things done and stick, and there's a whole science to this, that um, you end up with a lot of failures. and you you end up with a lot of frustration. And so I've, I've become a QI true believer, but I didn't start that way. And I think a big piece of it is, is the willingness as you get older to realize that even though we all think we're full of bright ideas, and I, and I always am full of bright ideas, and I'm often full of great ideas about how other people should do their work, and it became clear that um, the model of you're a doctor, you have a great idea, you write an order, it gets done, really doesn't apply to culture change. And in fact, that often my great ideas are wrong and that I have a lot to learn from other people, especially about how they do their jobs. So I think about two basic principles of QI for both <coughs> seasoned physicians and training physicians. Number one is you don't improve what you don't measure. That's kind of a core belief of being belonging to the QI religion. And the second is that you have to adapt the improvement strategy to the situation. I just want to give a couple of brief stories about that. The first one, <clears throat> you don't improve what you don't measure. Many of us um, were part of the era where we're learning to do better care of chronic disease. And I was a big champion of retinal screens. And my patients um, were having trouble getting to the ophthalmologist. So we set up a retinal camera, and we trained an MA to use it. And I was constantly haranguing people to get their eye exams done, and I was reminding my own patients. And nothing was really shifting. We weren't getting a lot of volume. So then we decided, let's, we got a new registry. Let's do a report doctor by doctor about how each of us was doing with um, our diabetic eye exams. And I knew going into this report that I was going to have the best score and that I would have to count a lot of disappointed people and then help them understand why this is so important. Now, the end of the story is very predictable. Of course, I had the worst score. I had the worst wait time. This took three months for my patients to get in. And I had to then look at going through all the stages of Kubler-Ross grief of denial, the data's bad, grief, I'm a terrible doctor, <laughs> bargaining. And eventually, it got to the point where I needed to go to the person who had the best score and figure out what exactly are they doing that's different than I, I'm doing. And of course, they were actually engaging their MA. The MA reviewed the chart in advance, did the referral for them. And as a team, they got a lot more eye exams done than I was doing just trying to remember to do it myself. So again, the theory of we often are blind to what's actually happening. And by having ways to measure, it helps us reduce that blindness. And the second has to do with improvement strategy. And Christine, if you could advance the slide, there's a really interesting model that I've always found is helpful. And the concept is if there's an axis of agreement, how much does everyone agree that this improvement strategy or this um, process is the right thing to do? And the other is how certain we are that it, um, how is the knowledge base and the evidence in terms of how certain we are that this is actually the right way to go? And so by thinking about this when you're trying to solve a problem, it really helps you figure out how to approach the problem. So let's take 
when, when everyone's in agreement that there's a right thing to do and there's a high degree of certainty and evidence that that's the right thing to do, then the answer really is just a checklist, just do it. You know, we see this in hospitals. There shouldn't be any art to the, med to the practice of inserting central lines to reduce, reduce infection. We all know what works. We just need to do it. And in pain, if you have everyone on the same page about what you want to do, then put in an EHR template to support it. Get um, PHQ-2 is done by all MAs. Have a standardized opioid intake visit where everyone, and the first time their new patient comes in with opioids, they all get trained the same, um, get taught the same thing. So there's certain things, everyone's on board, knowledge base is great, you know it's the right thing, just do it. Unfortunately, we often apply that just do it philosophy to other quadrants where it really doesn't work. <clears throat> For example, when there's high degree of certainty about what's the right thing to do, like let's take more people die when you prescribe over 100 milligrams of morphine equivalents and when you prescribe benzos and opioids at the same time, and that people die less when you reduce those doses. But that's pretty well known. There's good data on it. But many clinics, not everybody's on board. And so if you try and do a checklist approach, you're going to fail because a lot of people will just resist it and they won't do what you're asking. So then the strategy really has to do how do you get people on board? That's a political issue. How do you get compromise? How do you get buy-in? You know, the, the classic advice for there is before you have a big meeting where you're going to talk about guidelines, talk to some people in advance and get some allies on your side. If you know there's going to be a big objector, hear them out privately, really understand that point of view. You know, there's, there's a whole strategy about getting people on board, which is different than the checklist. And then there's another category in the ex experimenting where there's actually a high agreement about how, what you need to do, but there's not a lot of certainty about what will work in your particular setting. And so that's when this concept of PDSAs, Plan, Do, Study, Act, um, which we're going to go into today works, where you have to do some experimenting to figure out how it's going to work. An example is how do you do urine drug screens consistently and what's the workflow? You might do a few things like have the MA ask everyone to leave a urine every time. You might do a couple other experiments. You might have to figure out for group visits a couple different ways to do it. But there are, but again, it's a very different model than consensus building or checklist. And then the final zone, this complex adaptive zone where there's kind of middle degree of certainty about what's the right thing to do and there's not middle degree of agreement, that's when you tend to have to do more complicated tests of change where you have to get different people from different teams together. You have to try things out. You have to figure it out and as you go. Like a, for an example, for that, um, you know, might be implementing advanced access in your clinic, or it might be um, trying to figure out a brand new process that involves the front office, the back office, behavioral health, and you, and that may be a time when you need to get some improvement teams together and test things before you spread. So in any case, I've always, as a new QI true believer joining the religion, I found that this theory helps me figure it out, um, and I hope it's useful to you. All right, I'm going to pass it back to you, Christine. Great. Thank you so much, Kelly. I think that's a really great way to share some of the context for QI and also to hear some of your experiences as a former QI atheist. Um, one of the things that um, I really like about what you shared is that it helps us prioritize our efforts, um, you know, it, on all the various QI opportunities or QI problems that we're facing. We know that you're all so busy and that you can't have you know, a QI collaborative like this on every improvement that you want to make. So uh, this framework that you shared, Kelly, helps us sh kind of right-size the strategies to a particular, uh, to your particular problem. I've been involved in QI um, and in teaching QI for almost 15 years, and I have a few, just a few key things that I like to keep in mind about what quality improvement really is. The first key thing is that we're trying to make changes at a system level. So this is not focused on just individuals' uh, performance per se. It's not a performance management initiative. We're at, and we're not asking people to just be better. But um, it's, this is about system change. It's about change across teams, across departments, and across silos. And that these system changes make quality the default. The second key thing I like to remember is that quality improvement works best when it's part of a culture of continuous improvement. When everybody sees it as part of their job description and not just something that they're going to do during specific times, like 
when you attend the residency action group, you know, meetings or when your QI director or improvement advisor visits your floor. Uh, this is really an ongoing assessment of the problem or the opportunity and there's ongoing measurement of the progress that you're making and the changes that you're testing. The third key thing I like to remember is that QI has a strong focus on reduction of variation. Uh, many of the teams that I've um, talked with now on our coaching calls have shared that there is variability in practice regarding opioid prescribing and the management of chronic pain patients or you're seeing variation uh, in practice from evidence-based practice. So, you know, as we all, I'm sure, can agree, this isn't good for the patients, and it certainly is confusing for residents. Um, finally, uh, QI focuses on good and bad processes and not on good and bad people. So when you focus on process, when you understand how changes can be made, in a system, and also when you keep the patient in the center of all you do, then you're really headed in the right direction with QI. A couple of examples of QI projects uh, are there on the screen, like increasing patients with urine tox toxicology screening uh, or developing standard approaches to patients with abnormal drug screening. So, all right, how do we actually do QI? There are a few key models out there, like the model for improvement, maybe you've heard of Lean or Six Sigma, but the one that we're gonna focus on today is called Model for Improvement. And this model was developed by Tom Nolan and others, and you can read a lot about it in a book called The Improvement Guide. Um, it was first published in 1996, and it's kind of the Bible for improvement advisors, improvement people. Um, this model for improvement has been taught and spread throughout the country and the rest of the world, actually, by IHI, which is the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, and many others. The model for improvement, I, I find, is really simple. It's straightforward to explain. It's very practical, um, and it speaks well to frontline staff and to leadership and all, all the others in between. So there are three questions, uh, three basic questions in the model for improvement and a PDSA cycle at the bottom. So the first question is, what are we trying to accomplish? And this gets at the heart of what are we trying to change? What is the QI opportunity or problem that we're trying to address? And um, a really key thing to think about when you're thinking about this question is, how is it relevant? How is the thing that we want to try and change relevant to our patients, to our staff and providers, and to our organization? Can you draw a line between uh, the goal that you're wanting to, um, to work on and your organization's strategic objective? The second question is how will we know that a change is an improvement? And this question is all about setting up our measures, um, it's uh, understanding what data is available to us and the team, um, and it's how we're going to collect the data over time and, and creating a data collection plan and how we're going to share it with our team and with our sponsors. The third question, what changes can we make that will result in improvement? And this is all about, you know, what are the things that we're going to try that we think will help us reach our SMART goal? Um, and the way that you test those changes uh, is using the PDSA cycle, plan, do, study, act. And um, I know in nursing, this is taught as plan, do, check, act. So you may have seen it described that way. So let's go through each of the questions in the model for improvement one by one. Uh, here's, again, the first question. Now, this is where um, you come together as a team and with an understanding of the QI problem or opportunity at hand, you develop your goals. Um, uh, a lot of people may also call this their aims. Um, and to make the goal really actionable and impactful, we've been asking you to make your goals smart. And just uh, as a quick reminder of that smart rubric, um, this is what we shared during our kickoff webinar and what I know you've all been practicing in the writing and rewriting of your SMART goals. Um, and the clearer that you can make these goals 
and all the thinking that you're doing to put into it right now in the beginning is going to make it easier for your team to stay focused as you move forward. So um, I, let, let's kind of apply this now to an example. And what I did is I asked Diana to share a typical QI goal with us that's relevant to this work. And um, Diana, do you want to just state what your, your goal is? Sure, increase naloxone prescribing in our clinic. Okay, great. So that's a really typical goal. And now we're going to just get some practice at making this smart. Um, and I'm going to ask Diana um, a couple questions. So, Diana, in terms of specific, um, how could you make this more specific? Is this everybody in the clinic? Um, certainly it would be, we want to prescribe naloxone to people who are uh, prescribed opioids or are otherwise at high risk for um, overdose. And we could, I guess, okay. even define a high risk a little bit more, like, um, patients who have a history of substance use or who are on benzodiazepines or who, um, who are on high doses. Okay, great. So these are your, you're kind of honing it into specifically patients who might be more at risk. Mm -hmm. And are they on short-term opioids or, they on, or long-term opioids? So we'd want to target people who are on opioids for long-term. So we could say greater than three months. Okay. Okay, so let's get to the, um, the measurable piece. Measurable piece. So, um, what do you think you want to set the goal at? Um, yeah. So, I guess we would choose a percentage of um, providers, and let's say 90% of, uh, uh, or sorry, of patients. Let's say 90% of patients in this group. Okay. So, 90% of the, the at-risk patients on long-term mm -hmm. opioids will receive a we'll prescription for naloxone. Mm -hmm. Okay, so great. So that helps. That makes it a lot more measurable. Now, the question is, is that achievable? Um, we, probably not. There are probably going to be reasons that 90% that people don't prescribe because the patient doesn't want it or the provider forgets. So to really make it achievable, maybe we'll drop to 30%. Okay. Okay, great. So you're... you're Measurable is more achievable at 30% of at-risk patients receiving naloxone. Okay, and then what about that question about whether this is realistic? Um, what, do yeah. you know, what do you know about whether 30% is realistic? Um, I mean, it seems like a fairly low number, and I guess the thing that's going to drive whether this is realistic is whether I really think I'm going to be able to get buy-in, um, whether providers or nurses, whoever it is that we, we, we put this work on, is going to believe in it enough and and whether I'm going to be able to make the workflow manageable. Um, I will say that I, I think there is a sense of urgency around this issue among the providers, um, and they, they are looking for ways to make their opioid prescribing safer. So I do feel like it's realistic that we'll get buy-in, at least from the providers. Okay, great. That's um, a really helpful thinking process to hear out loud. Um, thinking about who exactly is going to buy into this, and is it the people that you're, that actually have um, the keys to kind of make this change happen. Okay, and then the last one, time bound. What, you know, so for the 30%, what do you think would be a realistic? I think I should give myself a year knowing how slowly things change. So I'm going to say August 31st, 2016. Okay, great. Um, cool. Well, so uh, thank you, Diana. Um, I think that we've made that goal um, just a lot smarter and more specific and, and measurable. Um, and um, Diana, is this like a real goal that you have implemented in your clinic? We actually did uh, implement this. We weren't as smart in our SMART goal. Uh, we just said we're going to try and see what we can get to. And we, after a year, got to about 30 <laughs> percent. So, Great. in retrospect, it was achievable. Great. Perfect. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. So, well, then let's just go to the second question in the model for improvement. How will we know that a change is an improvement? And um, 
what we like to think about with our measures is a family of measures. There are three main types of measures that we call this family of measures. The first type of measure is an outcome measure. It's, you know, the, the measure that you're all very familiar with. It's, it's that kind of central health, uh, key health outcome that matters the most to the improvement project, that matters the most to the patient. It's tied to the key things that you're trying to improve. Um, and just a non-pain related example is um, A1C levels in patients with diabetes that you might be managing. Um, the second type of measure is the process measure. Again, something you're probably very familiar with. Um, these measures, uh, these, these look at the improvement activities that you're trying to implement. Are you making the changes that you plan to make? So um, another example from the diabetes management um, example is the percentage of patients with uh, A1C tests that are actually completed. Um, the third type of measure in the family is the balancing measures. And these are the measures that help us remember that we're making changes in the system. And that if we make one change in one part of the system, it may impact another part of the system. So it's those unintended consequences that we're looking for. It's any of the concerns that the team may have brought up that we should make sure that we track. So for, again, the, using the diabetes management example, um, we're trying to, you know, increase the percentage of patients with A1C, A1Cs tested because we're ultimately trying to improve their A1C levels. And, a, and an unintended, unintended outcome might be maybe a backlog um, at the pharmacy for the A1C lab test. So um, let us uh, talk through, again, Diana's uh, naloxone goal and her family of measures. Um, again, she's trying to increase naloxone prescriptions at, uh, amongst high-risk patients, 30% of them, you know, within a year. And the outcome measure, the health outcome that we're most interested in is opioid deaths. You're trying to decrease opioid deaths in the population. Um, the process, um, one example of a process measure would be the percentage of the at-risk patients uh, with a naloxone prescription. Um, and then maybe a potential unintended outcome that you're trying to prevent is the cycle time of the visits. How long are these visits? You know, by prescribing um, the naloxone and having those conversations with the patient, is it, is it uh, making the visits too long? All right. And then here's an example of a run chart. And you'll see that it's, a run chart is a very simple line graph. It, it graphs the data over time. Um, and this is just an example. This, is, this didn't actually come from Diana's um, project, but I was trying to give you an example of maybe one run chart might be the percentage of at-risk patients without a naloxone prescription. And you can see over time that that decrease, which is, which is great. Um, and that one thing to note is the frequency of the data collection. You'll see along the x-axis that the data is collected weekly. And when you're running an improvement um, project, that is really kind of the gold standard, I guess you could say, for data collection frequency. Because, you know, if you're running tests of change every week um, with the team, you're really going to want the, that data to kind of give you quick feedback so you can think about and brainstorm what to do next. Okay, so um, the next slide um, uh, is about the third question in the model. Um, what changes can we make that will result in improvement? And um, this slide, um, it talks about the Plan Do Study Act model, and let's see if I can advance my slides. Here we go. So, why do small tests of change at all? Um, the first thing is that when you test something, you are creating evidence for um, the fact that the change really does result in the improvement that you're trying to make. So, you know, Kelly talked about, you know, uh, some ideas sound like a really good idea. 
So you're not actually going to know that it works until you, um, you test it in practice. Um, and when you do small tests of change, you're trying to increase the degree of belief that what you're implementing actually makes the change. Um, the second reason why you want to do small tests of change is um, something that you may have heard of about failing fast and failing forward. You're, you're, you're failing to learn. You want to try, and, you want to, try to uh, test a lot of things in order to produce the desired effect on your system because there may be limitations to the change um, that you are implementing. And so you want to fail forward and learn from those, um, those changes that you're testing. Um, the third thing is that you're, you're trying to adapt it to your local environment. So uh, you may uh, produce the desired effect in one setting, but you don't really know how it's going to work in another setting until you try it there. So this is all about testing the changes in varying environments. So that means, um, you know, test it in, um, on different shifts test it on different days or with different departments or with different providers. Um, you also, um, we talked about unintended consequences. And so when you um, do small tests of change, you get to observe what um, possible impact there might be on cost, you know, resources, time, or equipment. Um, and you might um, understand any other side effects uh, that come with a change. And then finally, um, doing small tests of change is a great way to get people's buy-in. Um, you know, a lot of times it's easier for people to try something new, a new way of doing things, if you present it, present it as a small, short-term, small-scale trial. You know, saying let's just try this for three days is a lot easier than saying you're now going to implement a new program that's going to change the way you do things um, from now on. So this way they don't have to, they can't, you know, they don't have to immediately abandon the idea, um, the, I mean, abandon the, the old way of doing things, and they don't have to immediately agree to making all the changes um, that you might ultimately want to make. Um, also, you know, doing tests of change can create some excitement amongst the team um, and can create a buzz um, about the, the work that they're doing together. All right, so here's that plan, do, study, act cycle that we talked about. Um, it's uh, pretty straightforward um, in the four parts of the cycle, and it is like a little bit of a mini model for the scientific method. Um, in that, in the plan phase, you're thinking about what, you, what change you're going to make and what hypothesis or prediction you have about what that change is going to make. Um, so you're also thinking about who's going to do it, when it's going to be done, um, and you're thinking about the data that you're going to collect. And you might be collecting either quantitative data or qualitative data that's going to then allow you to study or evaluate the change itself. So you've got your plan, and then you do, you're carrying out that plan. Um, you're making sure that you're documenting how the test went. Um, you've already identified who's going to collect the data. And then you come back together and you study. You study the results of the test. Um, and you have some time for reflection about the test. You look at the data. You talk to the, to the people who carried out the test and you discuss what happened. Um, and you talk about whether the data that you have um, met the predictions that you made when you were in your planning phase of this test. Um, and you discuss whether anything unexpected happened during the test. And then based on that, then you get to the act part of the cycle. And that is where you decide as a team, are you going to adapt it and try, you know, maybe well, let's try that test with a couple more people, you know, next Tuesday. Are you going to um, adopt it and say, you know, we've tested this piece enough, we're good to go, we're going to make that part of um, our process going forward, um, or are you going to abandon it um, and, you know, saying, you know, the data isn't where we need it to be, it didn't quite work the way we want it to work, and so we're going to try something different. 
So here um, are a couple of types of change examples from Diana's work on naloxone. And Diana, I don't know if you want to just take a, just a couple minutes to talk through some of the changes that you guys were considering. Yeah, so with a, this sort of big picture vision that um, we didn't necessarily get smart with, we said, okay, if we're going to prescribe naloxone to all of our patients uh, on chronic opioids, we have to have um, Walgreens on board because they have to fill the prescriptions and they're not used to. So we have to contact the Walgreens throughout the city and make sure that they're carrying the medication. We have to order enough kits for most of our registry because um, we did have a, a registry of patients on opioids but at that point. Um, we have to stock the stations with the kits. We have to then do a big teaching push so that everybody knows how to do this. So we have to put together a grand round send an email right after the grand rounds so that everyone who didn't go knows what's happening, talk about it at provider meetings and other team meetings in the clinic, um, add it to our residence curriculum, and then, and then we have to think about measures. So how are we going to measure that this happened? So we'll have the medical assistants enter data um, so the, the providers will fill it out, out a logbook when they write a prescription and then the medical assistants will transfer that into a database so we can track our prescribing success, and then we'll provide reports to providers about their compliance. Big Great. project. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, big project. And so a question for you. So with all those different um, ideas that you guys wanted to test, did you come up with all of them like in your first team meeting or, or how, you know, like how long did it take to come up with all these different ideas? Yeah, that's good. It was a um, so this was actually a big team of players. There was a team within our clinic. Uh, that had been working on quality improvement projects for pain for probably about a year before we started to take this on. And over a series of meetings, uh, we were meeting every two weeks. Over a series of meetings, we came up with a plan. We were also working with a team in our Department of Public Health that was interested in using us as kind of a pilot clinic for this. And so we were also collaborating with them over a series of phone calls and a couple of in-person meetings to think about how to build this structure. Great. Oh, great. So it, ha it, it happens over time and with collaboration yeah. with the entire team. And yeah. then were there any of the tests that you guys came up with that were just, just they just failed, they didn't work the way you wanted them to? I mean, none of it worked exactly the way we wanted it to because <laughs> um, nothing ever does. Uh, so I think, and we'll, I think, talk about this in the future slides. This is, this is kind of an example of how not to do PDSA because it's so big, it doesn't give you a chance to nimbly change plans as you go. Because um, once you do a grand round, you kind of have to stick with what you said in the grand round. Um, so, so for example, um, it would have been nice to have nurses teaching the patients how to use the naloxone. But when we started, we hadn't had a chance to train the nurses and we didn't have nurse buy-in, but we had provider buy-in. So we taught the providers to do it. And so now, as we really want the system to take off, we have to switch over to having it be a nurse-led initiative. And now we've trained the nurses. But um, switching what the providers know becomes harder because we did such a big educational push right up front. Okay, great. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Cool. Well, thank you, Diana. It's really it's really helpful to get some like really uh, real experience around the various tests of change on your example. Um, I have found out from Michelle uh, that Joe Mattel from her Santa Rosa team has joined us, um, and so why don't we go back to their team example for their SMART goal and let's um, hear from Joe. So I'm going to try to unmute you again. Hi, Hi it's Joe. Joe. Are you there? Yep, I'm here. Sorry about that. No, thank you so much for joining. Um, and we're talking about the model for improvement and particularly around developing SMART goals. And I wanted to share your example because I think it's a good one. It's a representative one of what others are working on. Um, uh, Joe, do you want to just uh, maybe say a little bit about what your goal um, is trying to achieve? Yeah, sure thing. Uh, so here up at uh, in Santa Rosa, we are based at a community health center, but we also have uh, a residency program attached uh, to our our clinic and our hospital here locally. And so we had. Uh, do you want me to 
Christine, do you want me to focus on one of the uh, SMART goals, in particular the, the one about the Opioid Oversight Committee, is that right? Yeah, that would be great. Okay, so uh, essentially what we're trying to do is create an oversight, Opioid Oversight Committee um, that will be based in the clinic, but will also include the residency program. Um, and essentially we're going to have a small set group of residents uh, self-selected residents and fellows who are interested in uh, opioid treatment and chronic pain treatment as well as safe prescribing have been already self-selected to that to that group. The idea is that the opioid oversight committee will be available to all of the residents, but we're not going to obviously be able to get 36 residency on 36 residents on one committee. So we're trying to pick a small number of interested residents. Um, we are hoping that over the course of the next few months, we will be able to institute and uh, implement our opioid oversight committee so that we can use it for the providers in the community health center, but also the residents. And uh, we hope that this will uh, decrease uh, pain medication usage, as well as uh, Sonoma County is very high on unintentional overdose and even death. And so we're hoping that that will be safer prescribing for providers, but ultimately for our patients. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Joe, for um, walking us through that. And um, what you missed before is we were going through um, a, another example of a team teamwork around a different kind of goal with Diana, and we kind of walked through how can we make um, uh, the goals uh, smart. You know, with, with what are the aspects of smart in your goal? And um, so one question was about the residents, and you already talked about that, that it's going to be a subset of the residents and that it would be self-selecting. So that makes it a little bit more specific. Um, and um, there, I had also posed a question here about what process implementation um, means in your SMART goal, and you talked a little bit about that. But um, so but for the purpose of the goal, um, Joe, it was, the process implementation is about meeting regularly and reviewing cases. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. So uh, it's going to, we, we're still, part of the reason I deliberately, I know I'm supposed to make smart goals, but I, I'm more in the uh, mindset of making more dumb goals. And so I, uh, I, uh, I left it deliberately vague because I uh, was a little bit unsure about how often we're going to be able to get, you know, it's going to involve uh, attending physicians, it's going to involve community preceptors, it's going to involve management from both the residency and the clinic, as well as residents. And so uh, trying to coordinate any one meeting can, for that diverse of a group can be very difficult. And so I deliberately left it dumb so that I, uh, I didn't overcommit to something that I couldn't deliver on. And uh, I know that that's one of the things I'd like it to be, you know, ideally it would be a monthly meeting. Uh, I think in all reality, if we get together six times in a year, that is going to be really good. And so uh, I suppose we could have fleshed it out a little bit more and uh, given you an actual number at least, I would say at least meet quarterly. Otherwise, it's not going to be meeting enough to be effective. But, uh, yeah, you're absolutely right to call me out on not, uh, on not using a very smart goal, and uh, it was deliberate. You know, and I, I don't mean to point uh, to call anybody out. Um, to task on SMART goals. Um, I don't think this is a dumb goal at all. Um, and just really pointing out, you know, um, what the kind of specificity you can write into the goal, but not only that, but the kind of specificity you can discuss as a team. And it sounds like that's a lot of what you've been doing and that this um, oversight committee is something you're, you're going to plan with many others to establish and that there's reasons for um, not putting in those, those specificities right now. And that's brings out a really good point about SMART goals is that, you know, these aren't set in stone, they're iterative, and you have to do it with the team that's involved. Um, and then in terms of the, um, an important outcome, you had already discussed that earlier. Well, I think one of the things you uh, may have mentioned was about dose ceilings, right? You want to get everybody uh, at a, a safe level of, um, of dose. Is that, would that be an important outcome of the Oversight Committee? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so we want to make sure we're safely prescribing uh, these medications. And so people who are above that uh, 120 MED dosing, we want to know, first of all, I mean, before we, before this 
committee, we don't really even know who's out there. It's kind of, you know, each individual provider is working in their own silos. So we want to be able to put them on our radar, number one. And then number two, wean those patients down as appropriate or get them a, a pain consultation. And then, um, you know, eventually get everyone hopefully below that ceiling. And so, um, so first it's about identifying who they are and then it's about how do we move forward from there. And so, you know, I, I mean, I think as, as you guys have discussed previously in, in webinars, I mean, the, the lower doses we can use, the safer it's going to be for the patients. And so um, that's kind of our ultimate goal. Okay, great. Thank you so much for sharing um, about your SMART goal and the work that you are beginning to do in this area. Okay, so there's just one more concept um, I, I want to talk about before handing it over to Diana, and that's this PDSA limbo party idea uh, for our webinar. And, it, and the, the concept is with PDSA, if you've been hearing me use the phrase, small test of change, and especially in the beginning of a project, the smaller you can make the test, um, uh, the better. Because, you know, I talked about fail forward, right? If you're going to have a quote unquote failed test, then hopefully you can do that failed test on a really small scale. Um, and so this, a uh, question to you all is how low can we go on this PDSA? So um, just again, the, the PDSA here um, is all around the aim that Diana was talking about with prescribing um, naloxone. And, um, and then here's, here's the a little bit smarter aim that um, we discussed. And the PDSA is that we want to stock all four nursing stations with 75 kits each and a log book to track prescriptions. So um, I'm asking all of you on the webinar to think about, can we make that an even smaller PDSA? How low can we actually go on this PDSA? So um, set of four nursing stations, let's just start with one, and then, um, and then we'll um, also do it with fewer kits. But what this slide is, is actually, it's what we call a PDSA ramp, and you'll see there's actually supposed to be four circles of PDSAs moving from the bottom left, which is where you're doing your very small scale test. And the idea is as you're building that, so you know that one nursing station with 50 kits, if that works, then maybe you go to two or three or four nursing stations and you build your confidence and your degree of belief um, in that test before you, um, you know, test it on a wider scale or um, fully implement that as part of your process. So those are the basics of PDSA, of the model for improvement I wanted to share. And I'm going to hand it over to Diana because she's going to be talking about, as you're doing this, how do you manage change and how do you manage the culture while all of this is happening? So Christine's been talking to us about how we refine our ideas about change. How do you make a good plan? How do you make a plan that's not going to get you into trouble later, but that actually moves you closer to a solution? It's also about people, right? So it's not just, you can't just have a good idea and things will change. You have to get people on board with your change. Uh, can you go to the next slide? Yeah, so one of the things that we use, um, many of you have probably seen this technology adoption per curve. It was actually created in 1962 and published in a book called Diffusion of Innovations by a man named Everett Rogers. Um, and what he was studying was how, how people actually take up new ideas. And this curve has actually held up over time. You see actually tech companies using it now to understand how they're going to market their new product. And I think it's a really useful way for us to think about how are we going to market our new ideas. I hate the word market, but how are we going to get people to take up, to buy in, to engage with our new ideas? And it's really helpful for me to think about you kind of have different audiences you're working with when you're trying to get people to engage in change. You have a small number of people who are innov innovators. And those of you who are making up a PDSA plan, you're by definition an innovator at that moment when you're making up that plan. And there aren't so many of you sitting in that room making up that plan. Your job is first to get some early adopters to join you. So the innovators are the ones who started using the iPhone right away the moment it came out, and the early adopters sort of saw if it worked and eventually picked it up, um, you know, maybe a, a month or so after it came out. And then you get your early majority to come on board with the plan, your late majority, and then someday maybe your laggards come on board. You all in your minds right now, I know you know who your laggards are 
for whatever project you're working on, there are people who just are not coming along. And there are other people who are jumping right on board with you and helping you out. It's really useful to identify those people because you need to treat them differently. All of us have the capacity to be laggards sometimes, and all of us have the capacity to be innovators sometimes, but most of us actually do have tendencies, right? If you have a leadership role in your organization, you know who the people are who usually will adopt change and who the people are who will fight it. Next slide. Oh, look. Um, so think about a time when you were an early adopter and a time when you were a laggard. What was different for you about the two situations? And I actually am hoping that a few of you can put in the chat maybe chat to the whole group or chat to me, um, what was different for you? What made you an early adopter in those times when you were willing to adopt the change early? Often it's because you believed the problem was real, like it, you cared to solve the problem, you believed the solution was a good one, you trusted the leaders, um, or you trusted your own role in the change and felt like you understood why you were supposed to be chipping in. But I want you guys to think about really how you motivate early adopters and what makes them um, early adopters. We're going back to the early adoption curve and you can see, can you see the tipping point star? Uh, the tipping point for any change happens when you transition from just the early adopters taking it up to the early majority taking it up, right? So when the majority starts to take something up, you've tipped over and the change is probably going to take off and probably it's going to have legs, probably it's going to be sustained. So our key is really to get enough early adopters on that the early majority start to think, oh, this is the way to go. The way we motivate um, people is innovators tend to be motivated just by uh, something being a good idea. If it's a better idea, innovators will get on board. Early adopters are typically motivated by a desire to be a leader or a champion, so they want to be on a team that's going to do something new and good. The early majority get motivated by incentives. So the team that prescribes the most naloxone is going to get a pizza party at the end of the month. That'll get your early majority acting. Um, the late majority tends to be motivated by seeing the value. So you can show them that in other places where naloxone was prescribed, overdose rates dropped substantially, right? That starts to motivate your late majority. And then the laggards, they tend to be motivated mostly by a mandate or consequences. If, you know, on your performance review, it will show that you have less than 30% prescription rates and there will be a consequence. That's the kind of thing that motivates laggards. Truthfully, for most changes, and even the changes that we're talking about here, you don't need your laggards necessarily to come on board. You don't necessarily need to spend a lot of time uh, motivating the people who are unmotivated. What you really need to do is focus in on your early adopters and your thought leaders. So the one time you really do need to engage a la the laggards is when they are also thought leaders. Thought leaders are people that the rest of your organization listens to. They may be thought leaders because they're in leadership positions, uh, so the CEO of your organization is going to be a thought leader, uh, regardless of how people feel about them. People will follow what they think. Uh, they may be thought leaders because they're compelling and charismatic. They may be thought leaders because they've demonstrated success in the past. People want to follow them because they're smart and thoughtful. Uh, they may, it may be thought leaders just because they're loud. I certainly have some thought leaders in my organization who just um, speak and so people listen. Um, and they may be thought leaders because they're angry. So most, most organizations have a couple of people who just gather people around them by, by expressing anger. Right? And so you have different kinds of thought leaders that you do need to engage in. If you have a thought leader early adopter, that person is the engine for change. If you can identify who in your organization people follow that it, and who is willing to come on board with you early in the change, that person is your engine for change. So I actually have a little video I wanted to show you. If you um, Google first follower stabilized, you want to watch the stabilized video or you'll get dizzy. Um, it's a YouTube video. I'm going to just recap too a little bit and bring this, link this back to what we're talking about. When he talks about first followers, he's really talking about early adopters. So 
cultivating your early adopters and giving them leadership roles. And those of us who teach in residency know this, right? We, we sort of bring residents up and, and give them leadership roles, and that's how we cultivate early adopters, and that's how we actually move things forward um, in our organization. So take some time to identify who are your thought leaders, who are your early adopters, who are your first followers, and how do you, how do you really engage them in change? The second group, of course, are the thought leader laggards, the people who don't want to make change, skipping forward here, um, but are also thought leaders. And those are people you also need to engage. And some of the strategies people use for that, um, it's useful, as Kelly referred to earlier, to meet with those people before large group meetings so that you can find out what their concerns are so that they can voice them with you. And you can actually try to work through them outside of the group setting uh, so that they don't kind of pull the whole process down and backwards um, in group meetings. Um, it's also really nice to give them ownership over something. If there's some part of the project that they can get on board with, giving them a sense of ownership and control over it can help to bring those thought leaders uh, into, your, into your process rather than against it. Have you had success bringing an important stakeholder on board for a project you've done in the past? And think about really bringing stakeholders on board above you in the chain of command. So your clinic director, your residency director, the CMO or CEO of your organization. And then also people low you, lower below you on the chain of command. So people, um, how do you get the medical assistants on board? How do you get the nurses on board? How do you get uh, the frontline staff on board with a change that you need to make? Um, and what I'll do instead of trying to get you to chat, although you're welcome to type something if you have a good idea for how you did that, is think about um, what are some of the things that we can do to get buy-in from people whose support you need. Uh, one of the people who, yes, so somebody just wrote, it seems finding a way to get them invested is key, a patient's story they can relate to, a need, et cetera. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. So getting people to believe that this is important is really critical. And what motivates people is a little bit different, right? Your CEO wants to hear about the bottom line. How is this impacting cost of care? And how is it impacting emergency room visits? How is it impacting length of stay? How is it impacting the number of patients we can see in clinic? Your frontline staff want to hear the patient story. Um, they want to hear how is this going to impact my workflow? Is there some way this is going to simplify and actually make my workflow better? Those are, those are the two different kinds of ways that we can engage stakeholders. And this brings us to the concept of the burning platform, which I'm sure some of you have heard of as well. So everyone's more motivated when they believe that the problem is real. So making a case for the urgency of the problem is really important. This is, we call this the burning platform. If people notice that they're standing on a burning platform, they're much more likely to move and make a change than if they think their, their platform is just fine and why are you asking me to change. So I am going to ask you to do a little typing here again. Can you articulate the burning platform that you're trying to address around chronic pain? And I suspect that your burning platform is going to be a little different when you're talking to the CEO or the clinic director than when you're talking to the frontline staff. And if you can, can you type just what is, how would you articulate your burning platform? What is it that needs to change? So when we work with medical assistants, for example, the burning platform for them is that these patients come in and they ruin my day. Patients dropping in for opiates, they yell at me when I don't give them. Uh, it makes me feel bad when we do give them because I think that they might be, you know, misusing them. Um, this is the number one cause of disruption of my clinic flow during the day is when patients drop in for, for opioids. And so that's the burning platform for the medical assistants, right? The burning platform for providers might be a graph about overdose death from chronic opioids, uh, right? Or it might be a graph of um, the, the recent increase in heroin use uh, in our communities. So we use different kinds of burning platforms for different audiences. There we go. I see someone wrote, patient-centered care, safety, and consistent prescribing practice to alleviate lack of standards. Right, so your burning platform is that there's a lack of standards. Um, and it might be even useful to really get into what's wrong with that, what's wrong with having a lack of standards. 
does that, again, for the medical assistant, cause disruption in workflow and confusion among the patients? Um, does it lead to less safe opioid prescribing practices and more overdoses? Nice to think about the outcome. So getting back to our curve, we've been talking about the early adopters, we've talked a little bit about the laggards, but really in the end what you have to get is the majority. And how do you get the majority? So the early adopters have taken it up, something is changing, and in order to get the majority they need to hear about it. They need to hear about the change you've made, and how it's working, and then they need to believe you. And this I have found actually to be the most challenging thing about making change in a large organization is just communicating, communicating your plan and communicating your incentives and communicating your successes. All actually really hard to do. People are busy. Residents and doctors are extraordinarily busy. And you may have noticed if you've ever written an email that they don't read your carefully crafted emails necessarily in the same depth that you thought about them, right? Um, and so I have found this to be the biggest challenge. Uh, I can come up with the best plan for change, but if nobody reads my plan and enacts my plan, nothing's going to happen. So communicating about change and communicating about the successes of your PDSAs is really critical and not a straightforward thing at all. So the rule is over-communicate. Communicate, I always say, 10 times as much as you think you need to in 10 different formats because you are much more aware of what you're doing than anybody else is, and they got to hear about it. Um, so again, if you can think, what are some creative ways that you've shared messages within your organization? How have you communicated um, beyond just trying to type an email and crossing your fingers that people read it? So we always do use an email, right? It's easy, it reaches everybody, you know, one third of them will absorb it. Uh, flyers really useful. So when we're trying to do the naloxone push, we'll put flyers in people's mailboxes. Remember, remember naloxone. Uh, posters in the exam rooms. Um, we found it useful actually to put posters in the waiting room that are targeted at patients so that patients will ask about something. Um, talking about it at meetings, changing your curriculum a little bit so that you're teaching about it. I have found personally that when residents get on board with something, they push the faculty to change in a residency setting. Uh, Preclinic huddles, We've, we have started using our preclinic huddles. We have a quality improvement project of the month. And every month, or every day in clinic, at the beginning of clinic, the QI project of the month gets announced so that everybody remembers what we're working on as a clinic. That's a nice way to get the word out. We make videos sometimes. We just finished up a video um, that we're going to send out about some changes we're making to precepting. I found that particularly residents are much more likely to absorb information in that format than when I type out a bullet pointed email. Um, and then providing metrics, right? So if you can give providers feedback about their own practice, for example, Dr. Kaffa, you are only prescribing naloxone to 15% of your patients on opioids here are the 12 patients that haven't gotten it yet. That's very compelling information for providers. It does require that somebody gather those data. And then checklists, right? Something that just forces people to change their behavior in the moment by using a checklist. So those are some of the options that are out there. And I would encourage you to think beyond the simple stuff when it comes to um, trying to create culture change. To recap, one, identify your early adopters to identify your thought leaders and make use of your thought leader early adopters and work with your thought leader laggards. And three, communicate way beyond what you think is necessary and as creatively as you can. That helps you get the people in your organization on board with change. Diana, there was a question um, in the QA about your naloxone um, improvement project. Yeah. Um, find it. Oh, yeah, how I did saw you it. How did, yeah. Okay, good. Got it. How did you teach patients how to use naloxone or did the pharmacy do it? Um, we started by having the providers do the teaching uh, only because we couldn't get buy-in from anyone else when we started. Once we got the thing rolling, everybody wanted to be a part of it. And so at this point, um, 
the pharmacists are trained to do the teaching. So the pharmacists do some teaching. We've also trained our nurses to do the education. So what we do is I write the prescription. I explain to the patient why I'm writing the prescription, which is a very rich conversation, by the way. It's a conversation about overdose and risk. We have some data to suggest that just that conversation changes people's prescribed uh, opioid use behaviors because they start to take it a little more seriously. So anyway, I have a little conversation with the patients about why I'm prescribing, but then I have the nurse do the actual teaching about administration, and then when the patient picks up the medication, that teaching gets reinforced by the pharmacist. So we are trying to put together, actually we are not trying, we are putting together a um, opiate registry. Um, and so I think we you had maybe talked about this earlier, but is there any chance you could share resources, maybe um, how you set it up, um, any files that might help us kind of as we figure out how to actually put it in place in a fashion that makes sense and is and actually works? Yeah, it is such a challenging thing. It's so challenging. It depends. Our EMR doesn't let us pull people by prescription, which would be the best way to do it, right? If you could just pull everyone on an opiate into your registry, you'd at least have a start on your registry. What does your EMR let you do? Does it let you do that? Um, we're Cerner. I haven't actually. I don't think we can on Cerner. I haven't tried it though. I, I don't know. Okay, that would be my first recommendation. If you can do that, you you will end up with some people who are on acute opioids. But all you have to do is pull the same list, you know, two months in a row, and look for the people who overlap, and you'll have some pretty good list of your chronic opioid people. If your if your list doesn't do that, which if your EMR doesn't do that, which ours doesn't, what we had to do was, uh, gosh, we went through a few iterations. One, we asked every provider to give us a list of their chronic pain patients. And as you may know, everybody knows their chronic pain patients because, you know, you know them. They're heavy in your mind. Um, so so that, that did work. We just made a, a file out of the names. Um, the other thing, once we had done that, we then went into our EMR and created a dummy ICD-9. It was 338.99. It's an unused ICD-9, and the 338s are, uh, are chron chronic pain or pain ICD-9s. And so that's our chronic pain registry ICD-9. When you go to ICD-10, of course, you'll have to do an ICD-10. Um, and we did it in the Cerner system, actually. And so now all we have to do is search for that ICD. Uh, and now part of our protocol when you see a chronic pain patient is you enter that ICD-9 uh, into, into the system. So that's how our registry works now. If I could add something, um, within a few months, the CURE system should be giving each prescriber a list of all their patients who are on opioids longer than 90 days. Um, so we'll give more information when that's final, but that also is a good way. Obviously, each resident in this case would have to pull up their own list, but it, it's at least in one place you'll have all opioid patients. Yeah, that's a great. And then the other thing that that makes me think of, Kelly, is um, the San Francisco Health Plan. So one of our main insurers was keeping track of who they were filling opioids on, and they were able to give us lists, at least for the patients in that insurance plan. So you might be able to get lists from the insurance plan. Can you talk a little bit about your tracking system of how you actually track patients, the workflow for the nurse or MAs that are doing it, um, how you keep providers involved, or Again, if you have any resources you could share regarding that, that's one of the things to figure out in our process of building this registry. Yeah, got it. Okay. So first you have to identify patients for the registry, which is what I was talking about before, and then you have to actually put information into it, right? Um, so again, it's EMR dependent. In our system, I can pull reports. Once I have that ICD-9 to search for, I can pull all those patients with that ICD-9 and then I can pull a report of their most recent urine drug test results, um, their most recent visit, um, uh, and th those are actually the main things I can pull. So it's easier for me to, and then their demographics, which are not that helpful. Uh, but I can at least pull and find out who's got a bunch of cocaine positive urines that I need to address immediately. Your system may give you more information or may give you less. Um, what we've had to do, because we want to know more than just people's urine drug screen results. We want to know whether people have had a, a patient provider agreement signed, a previous known as pain contract. 
-hmm. we want to know um, whether they have naloxone prescribed. And so in order to track those, we had to create um, logs in the nursing station. So for the patient provider agreements, what we've done is we have a carbon copy form, and the second page of it gets torn off and put into a folder, and every couple of weeks, someone from our pain squad goes around and picks those all up and enters those into the registry. Um, so we do have a little bit of protected time for a medical assistant on our pain squad to enter data from the, from the clinicians into the registry. For naloxone prescribing, we have a little logbook. When you prescribe naloxone, you write a name, you write the patient's name in. And again, the same medical assistant goes through the teams probably once a month, pulls those logbooks, and enters that information into the registry. It's very cumbersome. If, if we had a better EMR system, we, we would be able to just pull the naloxone prescription straight out of the EMR system, but we don't. As of now, we have two patients on it we're trying it with. And yeah. all we have on there right now is uh, medication uh, agreement, uh, whether or not it was done, and then uh -huh. if a cure report was done, and then what the prescription scheduling should be. That's pretty good. I think that's actually a pretty good start. It would I would encourage you to add urine drug screening results because you want to make sure those are getting done and you want to flag the ones that are off. And usually you can create a feed so that gets done automatically when you order a lab. Is that correct? Right. Yeah, most systems can do that. 